we know it's an early morning for everyone, so we're very flattered that you took the time to be here. Um, we're going to spend some time this morning talking about uh, a couple topics. Um, yeah. Um, so we went ahead and we um, created this nice disclaimer because we're lawyers, and so obviously <laughs> we want to tell you a lot of cool stories about uh, clients and things that they do and IR mistakes and ways that we can be better and work better with tech leaders and. So that's why you can see all this uh, disc disclaimer, this, the disclaimer that is really as so robust that you really can't take anything out of this room um, outside of Chatham rules. So, um, and then this is this is kind of what we're going to align our discussion to. We uh, we went ahead and asked ChatGPT what we should talk about, and this is what it told us. So we're going to go with that. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, Really quickly, my name is Jennifer Detrani. I'm a general counsel at Nisos. We are a managed intelligence company. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that, but if you're interested, look at nisos.com. And then my panel, um, Evan Wolf at Kroll, Winter Deagle at Shepard, and Chris Kleiner at Cooley. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves to you as well. Um, Evan Wolf, I'm a, I, I co-chair the and founded the Privacy of Cyber Practice at Kroll. I've been a privacy, I've been a cybersecurity lawyer for 17 years. Um, my time prior to that, I worked as a data scientist for the government and at the MITRE Corporation, so I was a hacker before I was a lawyer. Way to make me feel important, Evan. Um, my name you, is Winter you Deagle. You are important, Winter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a partner at Shepard Mullen. I was not a cool data scientist. I'm just a nerd. Um, my practice is primarily incident response and consumer class action defense. So I'm a recovering litigator um, by trade. I'm Chris Kleiner, uh, part of Cooley's cyber data privacy practice. Uh, like Winter, just a lawyer, uh, no cool background. Uh, my practice focuses on incident response as well as privacy-related compliance work, assisting in M&A and, and, and various business transactions, and uh, helping to negotiate privacy terms in commercial agreements. Perfect. Um, so that's us. Um, we kind of want to know a little bit about you so we know how to create our discussion. Um, let's see a show of hands for people who are lawyers in the room. Okay. Got a couple of those. What about security practitioners? Okay. And what about both? All right. That's strong. Very yeah. cool. This is a good group. Um, we have a, uh, a little prize for anyone who wants to go ahead and be brave and ask us the first question. I have a Nisos branded Yeti mug that is actually pretty cool and I carried it all the way over here from uh, the Tenderloin so I really want to give it away to someone <laughs> and not carry it home. Uh, so just keep that in mind and then we're going to just let people go ahead and ask questions throughout the talk so that we can keep it relevant. Um, and we're going to kind of just get right into it. Um, Obviously, the first thing that we need to think about is uh, the role of counsel, right? We have incidents and there's a lot of people involved. What is the proper role of counsel in that type of situation? And obviously, that's not a very easy question to answer, but we kind of want to align it on the concept of in-house and outside. So I'm in-house counsel. Um, these guys are all outside counsel. Let's, let's get into that and talk about how we work well together uh, during an incident. Evan, any thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing I think we need to understand is privilege. I'm sure everyone here has heard the three of us or someone else give the speech that every lawyer gives at the beginning of a call, which is called the Upjohn warning. You know, I'm, I'm an attorney, I represent X, I you know, don't represent anyone individually, this conversation is, is privileged, please mark on communication privilege, and of course the company can choose to waive privilege. Everyone's heard that. We could, uh, I've had enough people hear me say it that they, they uh, I've ever even recorded it and tried, and I explained no, it needs to be live and in person and contemporaneous and all those things. But what is that privilege? And that's the question that we wanted to start off with and then we're gonna expand on. So there are four elements of, of, of privilege, just because lawyers like to have numbered lists. Um, and, and the first is that there needs to be a communication, meaning either something in writing or something verbally or something in, in, in the case of, of signal or, or all other, other means, there needs to be an affirmative communication between an attorney and a client. And that's probably the most important aspect of, uh, one of the most important aspects of this, that there needs to be sort of communication between, between not you and the public or you just generally to the company, but between sort of whoever the client is and, and, and the attorney. 
and it needs to be in confidence, which once again, we'll, we'll go into how that can get blown, and it does get blown a lot, and since I have two litigators sitting over next to me, they'll be able to talk about that much more capably than I can. And, and then the hardest piece, and, and, and I know uh, they're gonna talk about this in a bit, is for the purpose of, of legal advice. And that is the one that's been recently uh, litigated over. And, and, and what that means in, in our world, since you know, if, if we were, uh, I guess if we were all sort of, you know, some sort of tort litigators and we're giving legal advice on, on exposure or negligence, It'd be pretty simple, but what does a cyber lawyer do in terms of legal advice? It's the regulatory issues that we need to worry about and the litigation issues that we need to worry about. So that's why, uh, without knowing what Winter and Chris's call sound like, it's probably a lot like my calls, where I always end at least the scoping call with, this is the potential legal exposure that you face. You know, the, there could be, because privacy data was involved or because intellectual property was involved, this is the type of litigation we could face. Or you know there are regulators, you know good ones or bad ones that that might come after us, and that way we can sort of put those, make sure we're meeting all four of those elements during um, this call. And so once again, anyone who is now thinking about how they're going to create a program, because this is RSA, uh, that's going to sort of be able to figure out if we can if we can do this via the next version of ChatGPT. It really needs to be between a live human, because I think there's actually been some case law on this. A live attorney and a live client. This can't be simulated through a bunch of AI or bots. So, that's the sort of uh, overview of a uh, of a uh, of attorney-client privilege. You'll be tested later on that. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a uh, and there's oh our first question. Oh, actually, do you mind going to the microphone, please? Yeah. Thank you. No, I'm not sorry. Perfect. <laughs> we probably could hear you, but it just it just makes it more mug. ceremonial. So just uh, taking a step back, because um, we're operating in the panel, I think everybody in the room is operating uh, under the same assumption that in after some sort of cybersecurity incident, you're going to have an in-house counsel and you're going to have an external counsel. But I've done a number of like tabletop exercises where I mentioned that and I get shocked faces. So maybe kind of stepping back and why do you think you need an in-house counsel and an, uh, uh, an external counsel to deal with these incidents? Does, does that make sense? Do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good question. Great question. I, I think, my opinion, curious what you guys think, I, I think you don't necessarily need both. I think you generally need one or the other. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's, there's considerations that's going to make, you know, having outside counsel make the privilege arguments a little bit easier and stronger to make. Th those of you, Jennifer among you, you that are in-house counsel understand, right? The, the, the work that you're doing as an in-house lawyer is not always legal, right? There's sometimes business considerations that play into that. And so if, if you have an in-house lawyer trying to set up and establish privilege around an investigation, I think there is, there's more opportunity for challenges to that based on trying to distinguish between whether this is legal advice, is this business advice, and you know, as Evan was saying, that's, that's one of the key factors, right? It has to relate to the provision of legal advice. If it was an in-house lawyer giving business advice to the management team, that's technically not gonna be privileged. So, so yeah, it's a good call. In, in many cases, there are both. In some cases, there's one or the other. Um, but I think w whether there are both or, or, or just outside counsel, you know, if you're hiring outside lawyers to advise you on an incident, uh, that's all we're doing is providing legal advice, right? You don't have that sort of gray area or bleed over into the business considerations. I like having two. So I'm gonna disagree a little bit and say I prefer having two. And here's why. Um, I've had to litigate the privilege issue multiple times. And when everyone has a clear role and has limits on what that role is, right, that issue is much easier to confront. When you have scope creep by outside counsel, which tends to happen when you have no in-house counsel, right, that line becomes blurry. The blurrier it gets, the less chance you have that all of this communication and the business discussions that are part of these communications are going to be privileged. Um, so I think in-house counsel has a really valuable role in incident response. Number one, they know your business really well. They know your business teams, they know who's a problem, they know who isn't a problem. Or if they don't, they should, quite frankly. Because 
I really feel like in-house has to be that bridge. They should be dealing with the, the IT teams and the cyber teams and all of our technical folks should know them. They should be having conversations with them, trainings with them, so that when you do have an incident, in-house counsel isn't someone they're meeting for the first time the way they're probably meeting me for the first time. There's already a level of trust. They already know the business. They can give me information that's gonna help me advise on the legal risk, but my role truly is the legal risks. It's not what happened and who fell down and how, you know what I mean? It's not a let's fix the business issue. And so in my experience, when there is no in-house counsel, that scope creeps. That's One other thing, and this may be, it bears saying, even if it's, it's a concept everybody understands, when we talk about privilege, I think the idea is what you're trying to do is make the best possible arguments, right? Whether or not something is privileged at the end of the day is a judge's decision on a case-by-case -case basis, right? There's a lot of case law and we try to do what the, what the cases tell us, but ultimately it's gonna be one person's decision under a particular set of facts. And, and sorry not to like answer one question like 20 different ways, but we didn't talk about sort of what is actually privileged in, in what, what the actual mm -hmm. guidance is. And in our world, you know, it's gonna be the incident response report. It's gonna be facts are not privileged. So the fact that you know, there was an IP address that, that is accessing a network that, that most likely is, is not gonna be privileged, but the impact of that IP address or where we think they, since so much of what cyber forensic investigations does is as much science and witchcraft at the same time and, and uh, that, that we're gonna have to sort of, that, that part of it that is, that is non-factual is, gets written up in a report, a daily report, and a log somewhere. Those are all things that we want to keep privileged. Also, when we start coming in and having different drafts of communication, or when we're preparing holding statements, or preparing FAQs, and, and preparing statements that, that different people are gonna make, and we, we go through and edit those, and, and also internal documents, and things like when we're following an instant response plan. So there's a whole lot of documentation that, that gets created by the forensic vendors and by the lawyers, and that's all the stuff that we're trying to protect. Because during litigation, that's the first thing that, that litigators want to, want to do, is, is create the record of, of all the mistakes that the company made during the investigation. And as we know, you know, there are no mistakes made during investigations. It's just a wandering process where we're trying to figure out what happened. So. Good points, yeah. And I would just add, like sometimes companies can't afford uh, in-house counsel. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, a lot of startup companies are starting because they have a great idea, technology. The lawyer is not necessarily the first stakeholder you want to bring in, you know, to create that team. And if there's a security incident, you don't have one. So it could be as simple as that. Um, we have another question. Yeah, actually, I'm in a security role and I've been working with our internal counsel on, on prepping for incident response. One of the things that came up is, uh, you know, between, you know, using external and internal counsel is when you want to bring external firms in for forensics investigation. So from, from what I understood, and I'm, and I'm not a lawyer by any stretch of the imagination, but if we want to bring in external forensics firm, then in order to, to preserve privilege, they need to actually be hired by external counsel. So that would be one of the reasons we need external counsel. So maybe uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say on that. I can actually take that. I'll start yeah. with that. I'll start with because okay. that's actually what my firm does. Um, so we, yeah, there's a, there is a, this is kind of going along with what Evan was saying. There's a desire to carve out this particular incident as a thing that is going to be protected by this veil of attorney-client privilege. And so when we do that, we want to go in very, in a very determined way that is very, um, that demonstrates that there's an intention to create something that is going to generate outside counsel's ability to give us legal advice about what the findings from a report would be. So outside counsel will contract directly with, the, with that company for the benefit of the uh, victim company. And then every communication is delivered directly to the counsel uh, from the firm, and then it is provided onto, uh, this is a best practice, by the way. I'm not describing what actually <coughs> happens in real life. I, I wish it did, and I think there's a lot of people who do do this, but this is best practice. And so when you have that, there's no, you, you can't really say that, 
again, that scope creep idea that this, no, this was part of what they were trying to improve for next year. They blended it, a blended statement of work uh, that talks about things that are related to an incident and then things that you're going to be improving is just not even worth doing, right? You're going to lose privilege right away um, and that's not going to, you know, help anybody. So I'll let you guys kind of tee up on that if there's anything else. So this area has gotten messy in the last two years, right? There has been a lot of case law that came out that talks about when a report is privileged, what aspects of an investigation are privileged. Um, basically, Capital One screwed it up for everyone. And what happened was they had an incident. They did not have outside counsel retain the forensic firm, right? They had a forensic firm that was on long retainer. Um, that forensic firm used essentially the same statement of work that had been used for the long time, um, you know, general cyber response, cyber assistance work. Um, the report was prepared um, and then distributed to 90 people. Um, it wasn't really prepared in tandem with the company's own investigation. It was a sole report that was prepared and it was used for multiple purposes. At one point, they, they gave it to like tax people and their insurance carrier. And what came out of this was a judge that quite frankly was really skeptical as to what the purpose of the report was and how this behavior had worked, right? So what came out of it is kind of this informal checklist that I'm sure outside counsel mentally runs through and that we run through with companies for the best practices, right? Best practice number one is that, that difference. The reason you have outside counsel retain the forensic firm is to create the line, right? This is where the privilege starts. Now that's not saying that you can't use your preferred and established incident response provider, right? If NISO says you're a preferred response provider and you have a long-term relationship with them, that is fine. In fact, I prefer that because they already know your company. But we get a new statement of work, right? We operate under my statement of work that says they report to me, that their report goes to me, and that the reason they're doing this work is for the benefit of me, so that I can provide you with legal advice, right? Then, a step further, when I take the report and I send it to the response team, the small group of people, it doesn't go anywhere else. It doesn't go to the board. It doesn't go to the insurance carrier. We don't send it to the whole IT team so that we can talk about how we can improve our incident response or our detection and threat assessment, right? Control. Um, I now don't have, here's what we should have done better or here's what I would fix going further, put in that report. Um, that may be an oral discussion that, that occurs at some point, but it's not gonna be in the report. And the reason for that is, as I said, the case law is unsettled right now. This is litigated quite a bit. So while these are best practices, this is gonna give you the best chance of protecting the forensic report and carving out that zone of privilege because you have defined lines. And, and uh, just to add on to that, I think because of the uncertainties, you know, there's a lot of companies and a lot of outside counsel that are even going a step further and don't even want written reports. I, don't want um, I have a process where you know, it, it starts with the inception of what the thought of the report is gonna be about. I want the vendor to call me and we just have a call with their thoughts. Mm -hmm. They can have some internal notes, but we don't actually get anything in writing until we hear from them about it. And then they're allowed to send us an outline of what the report's gonna look like. And we have another discussion and then they can send us a draft, marked draft of the report and usually it's cut up in small pieces. So, and I think probably, you know, Chris and Winter do something very similar without ever talking to them about that because that's how we, you know, I think of these as like war cruxes to use, because we have to use one Harry Potter analogy in every RSA talk still, I think, or at least I do. And, uh, and that's why we have to like cut them off because we never know, you know, how, what, what we're gonna lose privilege over and what we're, what we're not. But the other aspect of your question, just quickly, is why do we get called? It's, and, and this is something that I get asked a lot, you know, why, why can't, you know, all lawyers are the same, money and lawyers are the only two fungible items in the world, I was told. And so, you know, why can't, why, why can't you know, Jennifer handle this, uh, any, any incident happens? Well, we handle this as sort of all we do for a living. So I'm working on two scattered spider cases right now, and 
and I've done about another, another 10 previously. And so when someone comes in with a scatter spider case, which is a very unique threat actor in, in some ways, or Lazarus or whatever, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, we, we know sort of how, how that investigation is going to look like. It's not our first time at the rodeo. And that's another important aspect of why sort of we get called when we do. Good answer, yeah. And we have another question. Yeah, just a, a follow-up on the, what you said. I understand the importance of the privilege, but I'm trying to understand the practicality. If I have a uh, forensic firm on retainer that I want to work on, and I have a four-hour SLA, and we do have an uh, incident, what are the chances of me getting a statement of work through external counsel? Can that, ha can that wait? Can I call them? H how do I build that line without delaying my response with that firm. Yes, I mean, so we all have, uh, and I know just because uh, uh, Chris's colleague is a good friend, and uh, we all have MSAs in place with all the same vendors that you do with Mandy and the CrowdStrike. It's why we all get really nice uh, T-shirts and mugs from them on a regular basis. And yep. so, you know, and, and the other part of, of, of privilege, it has to start, it doesn't have to be a formal written agreement always. And so when you call us and we say, okay, we want to engage, you know, vendor X, what we're going to do is call them, have a new team put in place. I do this, actually did this with Mandy and twice this week, mm -hmm. where we said, okay, you were doing your sort of response team and now we're go you were doing your sort of the business team. Now we're bringing in an incident response team. Sometimes there'll be some care over, usually it's new people. And, and they're going to send over a statement of work pretty quickly after we'll have that sort of intake call. We can start, they can start deploying agents, they can start doing that forensics after that call, while we're sort of figuring out what this, uh, this owl looks like, while we're doing all those things. It doesn't need to be the like seven days of written and signed. And to be honest, I can usually get a SAL sort of drafted and written because they're pretty general within you know, four to six hours. I don't know yeah, that. about, I mean, I, I think you're right. All of us have our own master service agreements with all of these providers. And so getting a statement of work, you call us, we call them, right? Not every incident do I use the same incident response provider, I will say. There are some matters that I look at and I'm like, you know what, this is a CrowdStrike matter, or this is a Mandiant matter, or this is a Unit 42 matter, because they do have different strengths and different areas of expertise. The advantage to using you know, practitioners like Chris or Evan or myself is we use them all the time. So we know what those strengths are, which is why we all have MSAs with like 10 of them. Um, because sometimes they're just better at different things or sometimes they're swamped. And we have a close enough relationship with them where they'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, I don't really have time for this. And then it's on to the next. So mm -hmm. we can get it in place really fast. And like Evan said, you don't have to wait. It's not like we're waiting to negotiate a deal. You call us, we call them, they start. It's a, it can be a swift process. It just has to be an orderly process for privilege reasons. And I, and I would also say that I have seen, allegedly, allegedly, that you can continue on uh, before you've actually you know, negotiated this out. I wouldn't put things in writing, but it doesn't mean that you, you have to go pens down during an incident until this happens. We can backdate an effective date in the statement of work to that time that you started. So. Um, it, can, it can work out. Um, another question? Yeah, what if you lose on the issue of privilege? What about admissibility? Can you fight admissibility? Yes, you can. Um, it depends, right? So this is an evidentiary issue for all of the non-lawyers. Just because something is allowed to be produced in a litigation doesn't mean if it goes to a lawsuit that it's being presented to the judge or the jury, right? It has to be admissible. So you have to authenticate it. You've got to have somebody testify that it's real and true. And there can be cross-examination and examination on it. So yes, there are certain circumstances when you can fight admissibility. That's uh, the question was, what about the remediation steps that are in the report? Um, there should be no yeah, remediation the steps report. in the report. <laughs> like, they shouldn't be in there. Um, if, if you have a vendor that is telling you to put remediation steps in a report, um, get a they're vendor. wrong, get a new vendor at this point. Um, it shouldn't ever be in the report. And, and, the, and the, the reason for that is that if, if they are in the report and you don't do all of those steps, 
you've now created a liability for yourself that you didn't do what was required of you in case something happens again. You also, you also are potentially creating issues back to the, sort of the business and the investigative purposes, right? I mean, re remediation and, and mm -hmm. fixing things on a go forward basis isn't really a legal issue about what happened, right? That's more of a fixing things going forward. So not, not only do you have the issue of potentially not doing everything that might have gotten outlined in a report, but you're also sort of opening it up that it serves that broader purpose that when it was talking about for Capital One. And, and just to be clear, th we're not saying you shouldn't do remediation, you shouldn't have a lessons learned after an incident, you absolutely should. And you can even produce that as a written document. Mm -hmm. It's just not in the incident response investigation report because it's not, you know, if we're talking about, you know, something that is related to the specific incident, like at some point we had to reset passwords or, or you know, reset t sample tokens or something like that, then yes, those things may need to be described in there. But in terms of, you know, going forward, do all these sorts of grandiose things that, that those can never be in the report. We have another question. Um, what impact does the mandatory reporting have on the privilege that you're discussing with the SEC mandatory reporting and the soon to come SIRSA reporting? Um, does that pierce the veil of privilege or is that separate? Well, I, I mean, I guess I'll just answer from a, from a so I, I, I work with about 250 government contractors that regularly have to report incidents to the Department of Defense. It's part of a requirement in the federal acquisition regulations and the defense federal, uh, the DFARS, the defense federal acquisition regulations supplement too early to say this early in the morning and uh, okay. that they have to report within 72 hours. And, and if you go on the, the portal to those of you that are government contractors, there are 17 questions and one of them is a description of the incident. Everything you're providing to them is not going to be privileged. That is, but the, the good news is that's only a portion of it. And if you are going to be doing, that's why, if, once again, without ever speaking to them, I'm sure they do something very similar. We have executive summaries or sort of a short version of the report that's produced. That is an unprivileged version of the report that's different than the actual forensic report. And so that's how we handle uh, mandatory reporting or when we have to respond to letters from AGs. You know, we recognize that, you know, sometimes we can use fancy legal tricks to get some of that covered under privilege, and I'll let Winter and Chris describe those if, if they want to, but, <laughs> but, but most of the time when you're sending something to a third party, once again, it's that third element of you're no longer communicating it between an attorney and a client, it's now going out to someone else and it's no longer privilege. Yeah, once you give the facts to any branch of the government, those facts are not going to be privileged. So usually, and, and I'll speak for all of us because I think we'll probably all do the same thing, that is a conversation that you have with your outside counsel about, all right, what exactly is going in there? This isn't something that somebody in you know, IT or someone even in-house just plops into this form, right? This is a very thoughtful assessment of what we're going to disclose and how that is gonna be worded because every word of that could come in in a subsequent litigation or in an enforcement action. And yeah, just to put a, sort of the other side of that coin, right, is, is we heard Evan talk earlier the facts themselves aren't privileged, right? So it's not even a matter of putting the facts in the report necessarily that it's gonna waive privilege. The facts themselves aren't privileged in the first instance, but I agree, right? Ultimately, what you wanna do is you wanna keep any sort of reporting fairly concise, keep it to the facts that weren't gonna be privileged in the first instance, and so it wouldn't necessarily be a waiver so much as it would be sort of disclosing stuff that wasn't privileged in the first place. Yeah. We're like lawyer wordsmithing, basically. Right. We have another question in the audience. Yeah, good morning. So when we have clients calling us to initially respond to an incident, um, my firm usually does um, work to help them start rebuilding, recovering, et cetera. First question is, do you have cyber insurance? Next question is, um, are XYZ incident response companies on your panel? And if so, is it not the client's right and, and privilege to request a specific IR team to be engaged? as opposed to the insurance company saying, you will work with XYZ? My, my sense is this is contractual, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah. you have an agreement with an insurance company. They have the ability to set, set up a pre-approved vendor panel. I mean, in my experience, a lot of the carriers may allow you to deviate from that, but they wouldn't limit what rates they might reimburse. Um, you know, I don't know that I've seen any 
anything where this has sort of gone to litigation, whether or not they have the right to limit it in the first place. But my my instinct is that it would be it would be pre-addressed under your policy, right? Essentially, by by purchasing that policy, you're agreeing to work off of their vendor panel. So and as long as that vendor panel is impaneled, you can request that particular vendor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, there. I mean, okay. again, depends on the carrier, right? A whole lot of caveats here, but from what I've seen. Most insurance companies have, if you're talking forensics, six, seven, eight forensics vendors. And frankly, it's all the usual suspects anyway, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, it, where, you, where you run into issues, in my experience, I've seen this go sideways a little bit, is you've got, you know, client X wants to hire their nephew who, who just started his cybersecurity firm. In that case, the insurance company might be doing the client a favor by saying no, right? Um, but, but gen generally, the answer is, yeah, you, you have sort of a predefined panel, there's a handful of vendors on there. If you wanted to deviate from that, I have seen where the insurance company will sort of allow you to do that, but might say, okay, you can use whoever you want to use, but I'm only going to pay you X dollars an hour, which is our pre-negotiated rate with these other firms. That's also why using a really good cyber broker is important, right? So for those of you that aren't really involved in the cyber insurance side, there's no form for cyber insurance. So like DNO, Cyber insurance is very heavily negotiated. When you go to get you know, commercial general liability coverage or certain other coverages, there's a form. So it's kind of the same across everybody and then they kind of, and then this exclusion applies and then that mm -hmm. exclusion applies, very standard language. Cyber's not like that, very heavily negotiated terms. And so, and each company's cyber policy and what is, how the exclusions are worded and what is permitted in terms of who you're allowed to use and what rights you have, heavily negotiated. So I would say if, if this is an area that your company cares about, if you want to be able to use a specific vendor or specific um, insurance uh, lawyer, right? You can ask to have them added for the panel just for you. And some of my clients do that. Well, they'll just add us. Other times, if it's a really big incident, like Evan has a lot of experience with, with DOD, right? If you've got a nation state actor, you probably may not want a small um, legal team that may not have dealt with nation state incidents. You may ask for Evan. In which case, sometimes the insurance company, even if it's not in the policy, will say, okay, use Evan, that's great. But um, you're not gonna be guaranteed it unless you've either had them added to the panel for you or your policy says you're allowed to do all of that. I'll, I'll buy lunch for anyone who uh, can quickly get the uh, hashtag winter saying, use Evan, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to add in, about two years ago, the entire cyber market changed. Because two years ago, we went from a single company that would, you know, you would have AIG or whoever your provider is that would write a policy and they would maybe, or maybe they would be right majority of the policy with the one behind it, to most companies that are, first of all, insurance now costs twice as much for half as much coverage. And also you have to build what's called a tower, meaning you have like multiple companies. A few I just went through, a company had an $80 million a policy and, and it was made between I think over 12 companies. Yeah. And so you no longer are dealing with, and some, usually what they do is they'll have someone, this is why I agree with, agree with uh, Winter that you know, having a broker is really important because they'll make sure that someone's in primacy, someone's the first company, so you don't have to always deal with all of them. But I have two incidents going on right now well, we have to notify the entire tower about the incident. So uh, we're communicating with you know, seven, eight, or nine insurance companies at the same time, which makes everything that we've been talking about super, super messy. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's take another question, and then we'll, we'll probably get back on track, because there are some do's and don'ts that we want to get through, and also some fun stories. Um, question from the audience. Hi, I do incident management, and a lot of the times we deal with third-party data breaches. Um, and one of the things that always comes up during an incident management call is, are we going to request an attestation from the vendor that none of our data has been impacted? Um, and sometimes it goes to, no, an email should suffice, and once we get that email, we can close out the incident. Other times they say, yeah, let's get an attestation. So where does the this delineation, I guess, happen, um, and in what cases do you use it, um, just for better understanding from the incident management side. Um, also the whole idea of like nation states, um, I've heard that there were multiple lawsuits that um, 
people weren't paid out cyber insurance because it's like an act of war. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so when you have on your forensic report, you know, hey, this is a state actor, um, I don't know, sponsored by China or something like that, how do you, <laughs> how do you respond to that? So. I, it's, a, it's a loaded question. I think. So I think. To, yeah. No. That's a. That's a good. That's a great question. We were actually. We're not going to talk about cyber insurance, and so obviously that's why <laughs> Karma said we're talking about cyber. But it's a great question, and I think it goes to what you said about having a good broker and mm -hmm. you know carving things out. Like if that's something that you want to include back in, you should do it at the at the front end because there has been that this the acts of acts of war that. That has been litigated. Um, pretty, and, and in yeah. in, uh, in in a disclosure, my uh, one of my partners is uh, and my firm is representing an insurance company in one of the main cases in in that exclusionary lawsuit around the act of war. So um, I will not be commenting on that. I'll turn it over <laughs> to my lovely colleagues. But we're we're on the other side of that. So <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so we're yeah, not okay. all we, commenting we, on we that. We'll talk about that. But I, I think to the other part of your question. You can speak to us afterwards. <laughs> I'll, I'll get us back on track. We um, I think that you know, what, what you're describing is like akin to a an opinion letter of counsel, right? When you ask outside counsel to write an opinion letter, it's about twenty thousand dollars, you know, because <laughs> they have to like make sure that everything is true. Right, like you were, you, you know, this is your certificate of incorporation. That means you have this and this, and you have this many shares. That's it, it's the same as that attestation from a firm. That like I think it, it can be done, but it would require somebody to feel like, okay, I have to make sure that this is exactly so. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know much more about those attestations because I don't think we've been asked to do that before. I mean, we, we, we do them on a regular basis in a few different scenarios. The first is around what you described, you know, sort of th third party data access. If we've gone through a review and we've realized all they had was a bunch of, like, the, the threat actor got in or, or, or potentially got in and all they got access to was, you know, log data that isn't regulated in any way, that sort of is completely perishable and has no, no external value, isn't personally identifiable information as intellectual property, then, you know, then, yeah, we, I, sometimes it's, it's an attestation, sometimes we get sort of third parties to come in and, and qualify that, so if we have to go in front of regulators, whether it's state regulators, AGs, or, or DPOs, if it's a global company, and we rely on that as to why we are not reporting something, and that's where we can have an affidavit. Another one is where, um, which happens on a regular basis, you know, emails get sent, or we have to deal with a third party, like you send an email to uh, to to a, a private address or something, and you have to destroy it and you know wipe the backups, and you want to have some someone attest to, to that being done. I mean, so we, we use those. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule in that, but no, I, I would say, who are you and what do they have? Yeah, right. If you are a company, maybe like Meta, that gets you know, subpoenaed constantly and is under a higher level of scrutiny than a certain other type of company, maybe you're going to want attestations more often. If all they, you store about them or they store that's your data is business contact information, that may not be something that you are demanding an attestation for. So it's, it's really kind of a continuum of what do they have and what is your risk. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Okay, we, now we're into our, now we're really pressed for time, so we're into like our sort of speed round. Yes. Um, no, but <clears throat> Chris, I think you were gonna talk about um, why not bringing insurance carriers in right away can be impactful. Yeah, you know, I think this touches on kind of the panel question that we got earlier, right? I think there's, there's a number of different things that may come up. Uh, as we talked about, you, you may have pre-approved vendors, so if you're not bringing in an insurance carrier or broker to help sort of figure out who you should be using on a particular incident, you might waive coverage. Another area where you might waive coverage is going to be is if you, uh, if you haven't notified in a timely manner, right? Depending on the policy, you may have to provide notice to a carrier within some certain time frame, so not bringing the number early may cause issues for you in that, in that regard as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some other nice ones that we probably should share with you um, around ransomware. Now that's obviously an interesting topic for most people and companies these days. Um, I think, you know, can we feel like, would counsel ever tell a company to go ahead and pay mm -hmm. ransom to, uh, without 
also without attribution, right? Not knowing who you're paying. How does how does that work? How do you how do you talk to your clients when they have an incident of that nature? I, I guess I'll start off. Or, uh, yeah, go for it. So, uh, you know, the the the, the first is uh, you're not going to pay without attribution because that potentially brings you into a, a regulatory regulatory area of paying a potentially sanctioned entity, and that is. That, that that if you are a U.S. company that that uh, is covered by the U.S. sanction laws, so once again, there's there's caveats to all of what I just said. Then then you cannot pay an, uh, an entity that's sanctioned, and and most companies aren't going to sort of go into that blurry space of paying an unknown company. So, and the second point is, you are not going to be paying. In fact, in a, during one of our prep sessions, we we talked about like the parade of horribles, and I had an incident where uh, the, it was, they were a few days into it, and the, uh, the first thing that the, 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 the client told me, I think the, G, yeah, it was the GC told me, is that, well, yeah, we've been, we've been going on, uh, and, and the first thing that they said happened is that the CEO of the company uh, contacted the threat actor, to which, you know, once I, once I gasped out loud, <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I was like, how did they contact them? They're like, well, they saw on the demand on the ransom, because there's always a ransom note, how to contact them, so they just reached out to them. And I'm like, well, what did they say to them? Like, <laughs> how are you doing today? What, you know, what's up? And, uh, and, and, they, and I explained that like that, you know, first of all, can you, you know, his machine is most likely, and he is probably compromised in many levels, so can we just sort of get him to stop that immediately? And, and we bring in professionals. There are companies that just do ransomware negotiations for a living, and, and those are the ones that, once again, we, we all turn to and we have pre-existing relationships with because just as we've dealt with all these threat actors and we know all these types of hacks that are going on, they deal with and, and are negotiating with them all day, every day, and so they also have that familiarity that's really helpful. And that really becomes a very important piece of, of, of that sort of ransomware process because they're the ones that are going to work with the forensic vendor to identify the, you know, who is behind it. Are they a sanctioned entity or not? And, and that, that's a very sort of difficult and convoluted process. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, I mean, I, I think generally I would agree with what I've been saying. I think attribution, you know, put air quotes around that, right? I mean, I think you sort of do your best. In a lot of cases, there's arguments, even if somebody's purporting to come from some threat group, you say, well, how, how do you know, right? Generally, what they're going to do is set up a new Bitcoin wallet every time anyway. So I can claim to be the king of the world. It doesn't make me the king of the world, right? The other thing I would add, uh, in terms of ransomware horror stories, I had a client that was trying to facilitate buying Bitcoin by walking with a briefcase of money to a Bitcoin ATM. Don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> I think, like, these are extreme examples, right? But I think it really harkens back to, do you have a plan, right? So for a lot of our clients, like, I have a ransomware checklist. Mm -hmm. that they have been given, that if they have a ransomware incident, this is the checklist. It's very methodical. It's call this person, do this. Don't do any of the following <laughs> five things, like decide to email the guy that's holding you for ransom and hope that he's a real nice dude. Um, you know, getting back to like the core of incident response, right? Do you have a plan mm -hmm. or is is your business kind of flying by the seat of your pants? Overall, I will tell you uniformly, the companies that have a plan and at least try to execute on that plan do much better, both in the incident, in any litigation, in any regulatory investigation, than the ones that, where the IT team was just kind of like, eh, you know, we think it'll be fine. We're just gonna rib store the backups and see how we roll. Um, so I'm a big proponent of having checklists, testing these things. If you're not doing a tabletop or simulating a ransomware exercise, that's really something that your organization should, should think about because it is really common now, right? If you look at you know, all of the companies that do the research on how many incidents and what, what is most prevalent, business email compromise, ransomware, the bread and butter right now are things that you really should have a plan in place for and be testing for. And that plan does need to be different for business email compromise than it is for ransomware. Not every incident is created equal. And just to add a two finger point on, 
um, you know, the, one of the first things I say, I have like a standard speech when I'm for when a, an incident kicks off, and and my last question, one of my last questions is, you know, do you have an incident response plan, or what page are you on? Yeah. Because just having a plan and not using it can you actually create more risk than than not having a plan. And I'm not that isn't sort of for all the procrastinators out there to just not develop one, because the first thing regulators, in fact, the SEC is, does this on a regular basis, is they'll ask for a copy of your plan. Yeah. And then they'll start going through the incident report and seeing if you followed it and seeing where, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's like a bad, a bad game of gotcha that they're playing. So, so really important that you follow those plans. And since many of you are vendors out there, many, it's important that, that you know what the company's plans are. Awesome. Well, um, that takes us to the last few minutes. Um, and I wanted to just kind of spend a minute with each panelist asking them if they have a key takeaway that for this audience, something best practice that you can consider free legal, not legal advice, but kind of. Uh, what about you, Chris? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, plan your work, work your plan, right? Like these guys have said, working off of a checklist, I think really being thoughtful during a downtime. When you're running through an incident, you know, all systems go, hair on fire, right? Everybody's running around. Take, take some downtime before you've experienced an incident think, to think through your process. Tailor that to your own organization, right? There's not gonna be a one size fits all solution, but that's gonna really prepare you so that you're not forgetting or, or not running things down in the heat of the moment. Something I noticed about a lot of the questions that you guys asked today is the theme of why. Why do you do this? Why do we have to do that? Why, why does this matter? Answer those questions for your team. Right? Sometimes it's, it's easy for those not involved in the legal side to be really disassociated from it and to not really understand why we have to jump through all of these legal hoops. A really frank conversation around why that matters and what happens if we screw it up can be really helpful. I'm not saying threaten them, right? We're not saying because you'll get fired. It's because it's about risk to the company. And if they understand the why, people are far more likely to cooperate with the how. So, and, and I guess uh, two, two points. First is know your role and stay in them. Um, you know, at some point, and I, and I know we've all done these, there's some, some CEO who probably had previously been the CIO who had grown up in the business as a salesperson who then decided that they actually are and might be the smartest person in the room, but, but they're not the person that can run the entire incident and be on every call and reviewing logs. And, and we get those activist CEOs to which we have to say, no, that's not your job. And use your team, use your communications, your legal, your IT, your SOC. Everyone needs to stay in their role. And, and the second point is the, the fun thing about incidents is we really don't know where they're going to end up at the beginning. And I've had some of the simplest cases that I thought was, you know, just a very simple business email compromise, something that happens, you know, on literally a daily basis or hundreds of times a day across our industry that ended up being some of the most significant data loss cases or more challenging cases we have. And so, you know, never go into something predisposing where it is, even if it seems to be the simplest case, especially with access brokers now where you're having multiple threat actors in an environment at one time where you know, literally in the course of minutes, it can, it can change into a different situation. And that's, that's why I really, I've stopped sort of putting everything into a bucket of, a, oh, this is just another ransomware, because you never know what it is. Nice, and then I'll just add mine. I think, um, you know, lean into the relationships you have with counsel. I think we're, you know, approachable, and especially in this day and age, there's plenty of good cyber lawyers out there. Especially us. Especially these <laughs> ones. <laughs> and this one. Um, I mean, no short of <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, just uh, just realize that, like, we're here to help and here to understand and, you know, work alongside you. Um, I don't think there's room for a lot of lawyers who don't have that attitude. So um, if you have any questions after this, we're so glad you came. We'd love to stay behind and just answer any other lingering questions we can answer for you. And it was great that you guys came. We really appreciate it.